Now, I look forward to this next panel because it's healthcare reimagined and what is more important right now in our society than healthcare and really getting at, again, a way of doing this and, and being fair about it. And leading our panel discussion this afternoon is uh, Ashley Siska Klingensmith. And I said to her, I said, do you want to be introduced in any particular way? She said, I'm third in line to the throne of, the no, it's a, it's a different thing. No, no she actually uh, was very humble. She said, any way you'd like. So she said, I, you, her name goes by Ash every now and then, but she's been on the staff of the Pennsylvania chapter of Americans for Prosperity since May of 2004. And uh, she's also worked for Congressman Rothfuss, who was up here speaking earlier today. She resides in Pittsburgh with her husband, Robert, and German short-haired pointer, Burnley, which I think, again, is noteworthy. You know, that we, we have a lot of people who mention their pets a lot, I notice, when they get introduced. And I guess it's good because the pet came after the husband, so we know at least where the, the chain of command is there in terms of love. But with that, I'll turn it over to Ashley Siska Kligan-Smith. Healthcare reimagined. Ashley, take it away. Thank you. Give her a nice round of applause. Will you please? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be back in person with a room full of happy warriors. This is so refreshing. Yes, AFP, we are the largest nonpartisan, nonprofit grassroots organization in the Commonwealth with a full-time, year-round, permanent grassroots infrastructure. And so I always like to say, if you remember anything about us, think about the fact that we are the lobbyist for the most underrepresented and least organized special interest of them all, which is the hardworking taxpayer. So we're under the dome lobbying for you all, and it is such a privilege. But you know, while so much has changed um, you know, throughout the past year and during the pandemic, one thing has remained the same, and in some contexts I think has really become more pronounced, which is the fact that there is a portion of this nation that believes in top-down command and control policies. And we have got to be an antidote to those. From legislators to the professional lobbying class, there are a lot of people fighting for more government intervention in our lives. And so ground zero, I think, for their advocacy, both in DC and frankly in the states, is a single payer, public option, Medicare for all, prescription drug price control plan. And so there is this regular kind of chorus of Democratic uh, you know, um, staffers and also members that are lobbying for these ideas, and it is up to all of us to really fight against them. Just recently, Colorado and Nevada both have passed single-payer public option legislation. I know the Colorado bill had that provision gutted. In Nevada, the threat of a signature from their governor is, is on the table. And so that threat is on the march. And so at AFP, we are really working to advance a different paradigm. We know Americans want better access to higher quality care at a price they can afford. And we believe this can be achieved by passing a set of reforms that are patient-centered. It is not a silver bullet, and we also know that Americans don't want that. They don't believe the system needs a complete overhaul. They believe it needs to get better, and we know that expanding access to coverage and care and freeing up our medical professionals to just do what they do best, which is keep people healthy and save lives, is the way uh, we can do that. So we've got to dismantle the government erected barriers that are standing in the way. Throughout the pandemic, people like President Trump, governors across the nation, issued waiver after waiver to make license requirement suspensions, to allow you know, for greater flexibility and efficiencies in healthcare. Uh, in PA, we allowed out-of-state practitioners to deliver medical care through telemedicine. If it worked in a pandemic, why shouldn't that be made permanent in the ordinary course of life and business? And so these, these waivers, these licensure suspensions, served patients and providers alike. And so we know the answer is this. Less government equals more choice. So today, yes. <laughs> and so today, yeah, you are going to hear about ideas and opportunities that can happen in this 117th Congress, as well as this 2021-2022 legislative session 
over across the river under the dome. And so I am going to start with Dean Clancy. I also have my friends Matt McCoy, Representative Valerie Gatos, and I'll introduce them as we get to them. But we're going to kick it off with Dean Clancy. He is my colleague. He is a senior health policy fellow at Americans for Prosperity. He is nationally known to work on healthcare freedom, advocate, and domestic policy with more than 20 years high level experience in Congress, in the White House, and the US healthcare industry. From 04 to 06, he served as the top White House budget official on healthcare and entitlements with a portfolio that encompassed half the federal budget in dollar terms. He helped uh, shepherd the most historic Welfare Reform Act into law, authored the White House OMB Memorandum, M0513, that has quietly saved taxpayers billions and secured entitlement of a bill that protected life-saving negative pressure wound therapy devices from a misguided Medicare regulation. He is a frequent guest on TV, radio news shows. He's been featured in many publications, including The Hill, US News and World Report. I could go on, but Dean, you're fantastic. Welcome to Pennsylvania. Uh, talk with us about the need for folks like those in this room who are the tip of the spear, they're on the front lines as grassroots activists, talk about the need for them to drive an alternative narrative to the public option and what that narrative should be and how we can succeed. Well, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, you know, I could have listened all day to that introduction. Uh, <clears throat> that, that was wonderful, Ashley. But it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. And thank you for fighting the good fight. Healthcare, uh, I have good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is, as Ashley pointed out, the left is still on the march towards their century old dream of single payer, a government takeover of healthcare. And they've been gaining some ground in that. But the good news is, the American voter doesn't want that. Our polling and focus group work and our activists have found consistently <coughs> Americans are not looking for a complete government takeover of health care. They want to fix what's broken in our system, and there are certainly things that are broken, and they, but they want to preserve what works. We have some of the best doctors, the best hospitals, and the best technology in the world. And voters, even Democratic rank-and-file voters, are not eager to just throw that out and, in effect, put the U.S. Post Office in charge of our health care. Um, another piece of good news is that our movement liberty-minded folks like us are finally in a position, first time since I've been following these issues and I've been doing it for decades, I really feel where we're in a position to gain ground in the right direction. Uh, we saw, as Ashley pointed out, in the pandemic, suddenly the importance of removing barriers became obvious to people. You had to remove barriers to save lives. And if you need that in an emergency, why not make it permanent? Um, what is it that the left is trying to do? They're trying to do Medicare for all, single payer, public option. Those are all versions of the same idea. And what is it that our side is trying to do? What is our alternative? Well, at AFP, we use a simple uh, label for it. We call it a personal option. The idea is that we want to give you, the patient, the choice and control you want with uh, the quality that you deserve at a price you can afford from the medical professionals you trust. Trust is the issue with which we can win this debate. Who do you trust with your health care? The government or your own doctor? The left solutions are all about trusting the government. Our solutions are the opposite. And I'll just tick off uh, a few of the policy reforms that that make up the personal option. These are widely supported in conservative and libertarian circles, and uh, AFP activists are working to pass them, and in some cases successfully passing them, uh, at the state level especially, even as we speak. For example, HSAs, health savings accounts. Everyone should be able to save and spend tax-free for health care. An HSA is a tool that effectively gives you a 15 to 40 percent discount on every medical purchase. People don't know this. Only about 10% of Americans have an HSA because only about 10% can have one legally. Let's change that. Let everyone do this. And when that happens, people start paying more attention to how much health care costs. Health care costs is one of the things that's broken in our system and a lack of price transparency. HSAs help drive the consumer to the forefront of the system and therefore 
bring down costs, improve quality, and uh, we, we stop relying so much on government and third parties. Then there are other reforms like uh, uh, association health plans that we're going to hear more about on this panel so that you know, small businesses can group together and their employees can get access to much more affordable health coverage. Um, telehealth, we saw in the pandemic, is incredibly important. Scope of barrier, uh, scope of practice uh, reforms that enable, for example, nurses to practice to the top of their profession without having to be supervised by a physician or, or pay a physician for the privilege of practicing what they know how to do. And um, there's a number of other reforms that hopefully we can talk about in this panel, but that gives you the basic flavor. The, the, remove barriers between patients and doctors and amazing things can happen. We saw it in the pandemic, and the American people have gotten a taste of it. We're starting to pass good bills in the state legislatures. Ashley mentioned some bad ones, public option bills. Those are state level. They were watered down before they got passed, thanks in part to our opposition, and they're going to fail. Washington State tried the public option. They said premiums are going to come down. It's going to be cheaper. Premiums have gone up 30%. More government doesn't lead to lower costs. And so, uh, Ashley, with that, I think that's a good overview of the personal option. Great. That's the good news. Great. Dean, thank you so much. And can you just uh, tell folks, there is an HSA bill making its way through Congress right now. Is that correct? There's a bill that's been introduced. All the ideas I've talked about, there are bills in Congress and in many legislatures. Um, for example, Congressman Chip Roy of Texas, who has been a real leader on health reform in Congress, uh, Chip Roy has a bill that would enable every American to save and spend tax-free for health care. Awesome. Well, next it is my pleasure to introduce Matt McCoy and talk about a supply-side reform. He is the current president of the PA Association of Nurse Anesthetists, which serves over 3,500 CRNAs in the state. He is also the assistant director of the Nurse Anesthesia Program at Villanova and maintains active employment as a pediatric CRNA at Nemours Children's Health System. He holds a BSN from the University of Pittsburgh and an MSN and DNP degree from Villanova. And Matt, the first thing I want everyone in this room to do is thank you. CRNAs served on the front lines of this pandemic, many of them actually manned the ventilators in ICU for COVID patients that were navigating the most challenging moments of their lives. So I would just ask everyone to give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. So we are so grateful for you. Can you just chat about what a CRNA is and then talk about this uniquely terrible problem that Pennsylvania has when it comes to CRNA's title designation and then just chat about, is there legislation on, on the table? What's going on with that? What is it going to do to address the issue? But the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. You know, man, I'm very excited to be here. I kept some notes because Ashley informed me after about seven minutes, I think I'm ejected out of this seat totally and I have a <laughs> habit of running on. So um, Ashley's right, 3,500 CRNAs in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's a certified registered nurse anesthetist. Um, so you know, try to say that three times fast, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but we, who, I thought it would be important to say, who are we? What, you know, what, what is it that we do? So certified registered nurse anesthetist, um, if you don't know what we are, if you've had surgery in Pennsylvania, chances are you've had one of us beside you, beside you at some point in time. Um, we, go, we graduate from undergraduate degree for the BSN. Many of our CRNAs have to go to an ICU setting for one to two years, but we tend to see that the average ICU or critical care experience is about five years in, in Pennsylvania. At that point in time, they go back for an advanced degree that specializes in anesthesia training. It's either at a master's level or a doctoral level. All our programs are in the process of converting to a doctoral degree. That's an additional three years of training that specializes in just anesthesia. They have, on average, 2,000 clinical hours for just anesthesia training and over 700 cases. So I think the interesting point that I would also like to make is that here in Pennsylvania, we have one of the largest training programs in any other state. We have currently 13 programs right here in Pennsylvania. Uh, we produce one of the, we're one of the top producing states for our CRNAs. We produce in excess of over 300 to 350 CRNA students every year. The problem is we do have a little bit of what's known as a brain drain. We train these CRNAs, but then not all of them choose to stay in Pennsylvania. 
And that's because we do have a little bit of restrictive practice barriers here in Pennsylvania that we're trying to overcome. Uh, the first and probably most important one is that we are not licensed or titled as an advanced practice nurse in Pennsylvania. We don't have CRNA titling in Pennsylvania. We are one of only two states, Pennsylvania and New York. Now, although that's good company, I think that we're just a little bit better. I'd like to see Pennsylvania just a little more progressive. And so we are working on that. Um, but you know, what are those barriers? What, what kind of obstacle does that create for, for CRNAs in the state or any advanced practice nurse? Not only do we lose high um, caliber CRNAs to other states, we see drastic um, barriers to our CRNAs who are military professionals. Oftentimes they need to look outside of our state to competing states, Ohio, Virginia, Delaware, in order to obtain a CRNA license so they can actually practice as an anesthesia professional in the armed services. And so that has some significant um, logistical and financial barriers for, for the CRNA. The biggest and probably most important aspect that we've seen come up, burden that we have seen arrive though, is pandemic responses. So as CRNAs, we're oftentimes interoperative experts, but facilities don't quite know how to use us to our, to our skill set in these pandemic environments because we practice on our basic intro level, level nursing license here in Pennsylvania. So what we saw during the pandemic was a vast majority of CRNAs were actually furloughed or laid off during the pandemic because our OR volume had drastically decreased and hospitals couldn't use them anyplace else in, in the hospital setting. They could go back to work as a basic entry level nurse in the ICU, but they couldn't be used for their advanced skill set. And, and so that was pretty, you know, pretty detrimental to quite a lot of uh, CRNAs, but also a decreased access to care for Pennsylvania constituents as well. Um, on top of that though, we are happy, as, as Ashley had said, we're happy to announce that we do have some, some legislative movement uh, currently. We have two bills, both the Senate and House bill that has just recently uh, come out of committee. The first time we've seen this action in the last 10 years. And so we're hoping that eventually this will get to the governor's office and we'll have a sign off so where a Pennsylvania CRNA will officially be titled and licensed in the state. And so that leaves New York as that outlier. Um, until then though, you know, we're not always happy with all the governor's waivers, but this one was a particularly important was the healthcare waivers for us. It allowed CRNAs to practice without that burdensome physician supervision and it really allowed hospital facilities to determine the best use of the CRNA. We got many reports of CRNAs actually developing COVID response teams or leading COVID response teams in the healthcare setting. So as a patient entered the hospital that had COVID, an activation would be announced and a CRNA led team would go down to secure the airway, do invasive lines and monitoring and make sure that patient is comfortably transported to the ICU. It also allowed facilities to use CRNAs as what we like to say is physician extenders. And so if a physician is in the ICU is overburdened, a CRNA can go up there and help again with invasive management, line placement, monitoring, and it allows that physician to reach multiple patients that they may not, he or she may not be able to do without that CRNA presence. Uh, and so for that, we're, we're, we're really excited. Um, those waivers are elected to be suspended in September. Uh, we really feel that they really should be a permanent part of the healthcare landscape. We totally so agree. We'll be working hard to make sure they are. Matt, thank you for all you do. We are just so grateful for the services you provided at the most kind of trying times. So thank you, thank you so much. Last but certainly not least, Representative Valerie Gatos is here. She serves the 44th Legislative District. She is serving her second term, so that's out in Pittsburgh. She came to the legislature from working in the private sector for years, being a business owner herself. She is a champion for startup and small businesses who is committed to addressing the tax and regulatory barriers that are holding these constituencies back. She has introduced legislation that would provide a mechanism for employers to join together to negotiate for discounted health insurance coverage in the same way that large businesses purchase group benefits. So as we consider kind of the cries from the left, for a public option or Medicare for all, we all should be elevating market-driven coverage side opportunities and alternatives to insurance. So Representative, would you chat a little bit about your legislation, what inspired you to introduce it and champion it, where it is in the legislative process, and then I want you to end with why you think everyone in this room should feel a sense of hope about what is happening under the dome. 
Thank you, Ashley. And um, I'll tell you, it's really wonderful to see everybody here and uh, you know, after the whole year of a uh, lot of absences. Uh, but we have been working hard. And so my background with the uh, Association Health Plan Bill, one of the reasons why I introduced it is having run my own business, having worked with a lot of startup companies, the top two expenses uh, that, that small business face is energy and healthcare. And really, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it's something that is so important. And um, so myself, when I had my company uh, in 2008, after the Affordable Care Act uh, was introduced, of course, we were all told that you know, this was going to give new opportunities and expand coverage. Well, the following year, my health care coverage went up uh, almost 18%. The following year, it went up, I think, 12%. And then it continued to do that. And I had staff people who were 10 years younger than I am, and it still went up. So this was a real source of frustration for me. And when I looked at that, I realized that the association, uh, association health plans, which were once permitted prior to the, to the Affordable Care Act, were suddenly now prohibited. Now, talk about you know, having the ACA being discriminatory against small business, being punitive towards small business, that's really what it was. And here, the larger corporations were still able to pool and, and provide that uh, to, uh, to, as a benefit to their companies. So now, somebody, my background was that I invested in small startup companies. Now, here's a small startup company now having to pay even more money for healthcare. How do you build a company if now you've got the competition from the larger company. So this goes back to what we were talking about, big tech. Well, big tech is now offered, is able to offer large, you know, more benefits to these small companies. So I'd like to bring back the association health plans and enable companies that have um, at least, uh, actually I should say that the pool of companies have 50 employees or more. So let's say if you're a life sciences company that has two employees, you can pool with companies uh, of a like mind, and as long as you have 50 or more, you can then get that same groove coverage. Uh, same thing for uh, the, uh, the restaurant industry. You've got a restaurant industry that has a lot of employees statewide. This would be an opportunity for them to offer health care. And, and we have shown that offering association health plans will actually expand coverage to people who are not having coverage right now, people who cannot afford to pay into the Affordable Care Act. So this is, this is sort of a no-brainer, and we have um, had a lot of discussions with our state uh, insurance commissioner who basically says, well, you know, and I'm going to summarize really what, what the, the response is. Well, somebody's got to pay for the Affordable Care Act, and somebody's got to pay for the exchange. Um, we're just saying that it's just unfair because it's an unfair burden put on small businesses. Uh, now the response comes back, well, Let's spread it across and go to a single payer system and include these big corporations in that. Um, I don't know about you, but um, a monopoly, whether it's a government-owned monopoly or a private sector monopoly, it is still a monopoly. I am not for government monopolies, and this is really where we're heading. I am for the free market, and um, you know, let's 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 have legislation that enables us to do what was taken away from us. Um, in, in, in the, by the excuse of fairness. Well, let's be fair. And so it is House Bill 555. Can you just talk about where it is in the process? Sure. So just remember that, House Bill 555. <laughs> uh, easy to remember. Uh, so call your legislator and tell them to uh, uh, you know, support this bill. It is now in the insurance committee. Uh, we've got a number of the insurance committee members who are very supportive of that. Uh, there's a lot of information going back and forth on why it won't work. The other excuse that they're saying is that, well, the Biden administration has now um, initiated a subsidy. Well, we all know a subsidy is just temporary. Uh, that's not permanent. You know, we want something that is predictable, that's permanent. Um, and so right now it is in committee, and we'd like to see that uh, pass through committee. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. And I, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I know that everyone here is here because you believe this is a nation where anybody with nothing can become anything. And right now, there are some serious government erected barriers that are standing in people's way. And every day at AFP, we get up trying to fight to make 
anyone's version of the American dream, the path to get there less arduous. And so we invite you all right now, we are an organization about action. Pull out your phone, you can visit healthcarereimaginedpa.com and right on that site, we have listed for you all of the committee chairs and minority <laughs> chairs, their Twitter handles, their Facebook pages, so you can tweet at them, tag them in a Facebook post, ask them to pass some of this legislation, and right there on healthcarereimaginedpa.com, there is a letter. It will take you under 30 seconds to sign it, and it is going to go directly to the inbox of your state representative and your state senator. It's going to talk about things like telemedicine, like scope of practice, like CRNA title designation, and like association health plans. All the bills are there. You don't have to do the work. We've done it for you. We just need you to be effective grassroots lobbyists. And so we are just so grateful for your time. HealthcareReimaginedPA.com. Our booth is right out in the uh, lobby, and so we hope you'll drop by and say hi. But thank you so much for your time, and enjoy the conference.